for updates on our prayer list. All right, we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, we're in a great section in Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to continue our study there. But before we begin our Bible study, we're going to allow a few moments of silent time where you can pray and represent yourself before the throne of grace. This is the time to examine your life, and if you have any past personal sin in the life that's unconfessed, you can confess that to God the Father in Jesus' name and receive forgiveness and cleansing. That's 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So let's bow our heads together for just a few moments. I'll finish this out in a group prayer. Our Father God in heaven, we're so grateful to have our freedom and be able to come and gather together as born-again Christians without persecution. And Father, we pray for our military men and women around the world who are fighting for that freedom. We pray you'd build them up, encourage them, give them the ability to neutralize our enemies around the world. Father, we pray for our policemen and women here inside America. We pray that you would bring them encouragement. Give them the ability to apprehend the criminals who seek to destroy our freedom stateside. Father, we pray for our leadership in America that you would raise up and guide men to guide our country towards more and more freedom. We pray for our elections coming up. Father, we pray that you would bring a, this election to a peaceful and lawful and just effect. Father, we pray for our ministries in the Philippines, specifically for our children that we have a hand in helping. Father, we pray that you would raise up the next generation of leaders to guide their country towards peace, freedom, and prosperity. Father, we pray for our friends in Israel and in Korea. We pray for our schools and colleges and students and teachers here. We pray for the Bible conference coming in Shreveport. Father, we pray that not only would there be travel safety, but that there could be good health and that the mes message would be uh, clear and that the people would be ready to receive that message. Father, we pray for our friends on the prayer list, the ones that are sick. We pray that you'd heal them, whether it be by medicine or by miracle. Father, we pray for our friends who are suffering. We pray that you would ease their pain. Remind them of your grace, which is sufficient. For our friends who have lost loved ones, Father, we pray that you would be with them in their grief. Remind them of your precious promises which brings the peace that passes all understanding. We thank you and praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Ephesians chapter 2 is the grace panorama. The grace panorama, verses 1 through 10, are the overview of grace. And the question is, is what policy would perfect God have in dealing with totally depraved man? Grace. The answer is grace. We were working in verse 5. I want to give you a little preview of verse 6 as we are going to move on shortly. Even when we were dead... So this is your life as an unbeliever. Before you trusted in Christ for salvation, you were dead spiritually. And so spiritual death reigns. Romans chapter 5 says that when Adam died, we all died spiritually. 
when he ate the forbidden fruit, he stood as the head of the human race, and we all fell together. And so therefore we were born into spiritual death, even when we were dead in trespasses. And there's three strikes against us in Adam. First, we had an old sin nature. It was provided through your father. It contaminates every cell of your human body. Secondly, Adam's original sin imputed. It was imputed to us all the moment we took our first breath. And then finally, you sin personally, and that's a trespass. So your third strike is mentioned. Even when we were in the sphere of spiritual death, that is Adam, in trespasses, so you're known as a sinner, as an unbeliever. God made us alive together with Christ by the baptism of the Spirit. And then He reiterates His policy towards depraved mankind. By grace, you have been saved. And that word saved in the Greek is <clears throat> in the verb tense. It means saved in the past with results that go on forever. That means that once you believed in Christ, you entered eternal salvation and nothing can take it away. Now, verse 6 is our verse coming up, and it gives us our identity in Christ and raised us up together. Because you're in Christ, now you share all that Christ has and is. And that means that you were raised with Him. In resurrection, you were raised up and made us sit together. This is session where Jesus Christ is seated at the right hand of God the Father. Right now, we're identified with Him in the heavenly places in Christ. In the heavenly places here is where Jesus Christ is enthroned in the third heaven. And so we're seeing our new identity as a believer in verse 6, and we're headed towards this verse with a full steam ahead but before we get there we've got to cover one last aspect we've been working on what happened the moment you were saved what happened the moment you believed in Christ what happened the moment you trusted in Jesus for salvation? You see, a lot of people are trusting in their good works to make them right with God. They're headed to hell. They're headed to hell. You've got to trust in the work of Christ. That's what makes us right with God. Only the work of Jesus Christ upon the cross. We trust in the blood of Christ, His sacrifice on our behalf. You see that? And at that moment, the Bible says, heirs tense, when we trust in Christ for the first time, when we know our works aren't good enough, when we know we can't get into heaven on our merit, when we believe in the merit of Jesus Christ, His person and His work, we are born again forever and always. God did 40 things for you at that moment. 40 things He did for the believer. He didn't do it for the unbelievers. He did it only for the Christians. You see, Jesus says, God makes the sun to set for the believer and the unbeliever. God brings the rain upon the earth for the believer and the unbeliever. So that means a Christian, a born-again Christian and an unbeliever can look at a sunset and enjoy it both. They both receive it. 
The Bible says that the believer and the unbeliever can sit down at a beautiful meal that was brought forth because of the rain. And they both can enjoy it. God's done it for them both. The question is, what has He done only for the Christian? What has He done only for the Christian? And that's what you need to emphasize on your Facebook page. See, we get, we get too many sunset pictures and say, God bless me today. Well, look here. Some Arab on jihad out there in the desert killing Christians got the same sunset. You hearing me? You go to the top of the mountain and you post on your Facebook wall, this is my church. And some Hindu is on the top of same, some same mountain and he's worshiping the created and not the creator. You see how we've gone awry? We're making mistakes. We've got to emphasize what God has done for the Christian. Not the unbeliever. And when you see these 40 things, by golly, it's for Christians only. Church age. It's for the believer only. And this is what God has done for you. Now, I have to ask you another question. It's rhetorical. You don't have to answer. How can I ever come to the place where I love God? I've asked myself that question because I know Jesus said we should love God with all our hearts, all our minds, and all of our souls. He said it as a command. How do I do it? How do I do it, Brad? I want to love God, but I don't know how. The answer is this. Learn what He has done for you. It only comes from the Word of God. See, when you find out all that God has done for you, you can't help but love Him. He is totally benevolent towards you. He wants your well-being. He wants you to do good. He wants you to succeed. And He's done all of these things to be able to support that in your life. So as we're studying these 40 things that happened the moment you were saved, it's not just, you know, academic. Yeah, it's a long list of things that happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yada, yada, yada. No, this is what God has done for you personally, each one of you. And you ought to take it to heart. And you ought to be not only thankful, but you ought to be in awe that God would look down and see little old you down here on earth and be that benevolent towards you that have that much love. So let's take a look at just a review quickly because we're actually on number 40. We made it through 39 the last two weeks. First, efficacious grace. It means He made your faith effective for salvation. Secondly, regeneration. This is God the Holy Spirit manufacturing or renewing the human spirit inside of you. The indwelling of God the Holy Spirit. This is God the Holy Spirit taking up residence inside the newly regenerated human spirit and making a temple worthy of the indwelling of the Shekinah glory of Jesus Christ. Fourth, God sealed the deal. The transaction is done. You're His forever and nothing can change it. That's sealing. The baptism of the Spirit places you in union with Christ. It's where God the Holy Spirit took you by the nap of the neck and placed you into Christ, no water anywhere. God gave you a spiritual gift in the church age. One of these ten. 
I love seeing my professional guys, my professional friends that love to work. I have friends that love to work. They absolutely love it. And I think that's why we're friends, because I love to work myself. And they've gotten a profession and they've gotten good at it. And they're at the top of their field. But that's a talent that God gave you. It just so happens that you get to use that talent to make money. And whether you're the greeter at Walmart and you say, you smile and you say hello, or whether you're machining some pristine mechanism, God gave you that talent to glorify Him. See, that's the use of the talent that you receive. Maybe your career, whatever it is. Maybe your talent is smiling. I don't know. Use it to glorify God. That's the issue. But God has also given you a spiritual gift at the moment you were born again. And just like a talent, the skill has to be cultivated so that your spiritual gift, the skill has to be cultivated. Now here's the point. While God has given us talents, they're to be used to glorify Him. God's also given us a spiritual gift, and guess who they glorify? The man upstairs. So we're all slaves of Jesus Christ, and we all point to the one upstairs who gave us not only the talent, but the spiritual gift. We're a new spiritual species, species in 2 Corinthians 5.17. We're a new kind that's never been seen before in the church age. Not only do we have the indwelling of the Spirit, we have the completed canon of Scripture. We have the triune Godhead indwelling us. We have received justification we have received imputation and positional righteousness. Propitiation, that's the satisfaction of God the Father's plus R. Reconciliation, that is the demolishing of the burial, barrier, the dividing wall. Redemption, we've all been bought out of the slave market of sin. Unlimited atonement. That means that Jesus died for the sins of the world. Your past, present, and future sins. Positional sanctification. That means you've been raised up higher than the angels. Deliverance. That means you can't even warm your feet up with the fires of hell. There is no purgatory. The Catholic Church is wrong. You have been delivered. You receive the imputation of eternal life. You receive eternal security. You receive a foundation upon which to build. I love that. Because if you do good works that is divine good, guess what? They're built on the foundation of Christ that they may stand. We have access to God. We've been delivered from Satan's kingdom and transferred into the kingdom of God. We receive equality. I love it. The government says they're going to make us all equal by the redistribution of wealth. That's satanic utopianism. It cannot be achieved here in this life. Socialism can, all, can only make you equally poor where you get to decide whose cat you're going to have for dinner. You see, I'm telling you a joke, but it's for real, and I want it to stick. The youngest generation is not getting the truth. And the truth is this. God presented a tax system in the Bible. You tell Bernie Sanders supporters this, friend. If you're born again... You don't need to vote for socialism. God presented a tax code in the Bible. It has every citizen of country Israel 
paying the same percentage of their income in taxes. If you made very little money, you paid in very little taxes. If you made a lot of money, you paid in a lot of taxes, but it was always the same percent. You hear me? That's from God who created the human race. And so you challenge them to that point and leave it with them. They're always going to have a but. You see, jealousy is a terrible sin. So here's what I'm going to tell you. Where there is freedom, there is no equality because I can get up and go work earlier and stay longer than you. You see that? I've used my freedom to go to work and make more money than you. Don't be jealous of that. Where there's freedom, there's always inequality. You can use your volition wisely and separate yourself from fellow humanity by being a winner in this life. And the so socialistic utopianism says, you may be a loser and you may be living in the basement, but I'm going to let you catch up to this guy who's working his tail off I'm going to take his money through taxation and I'm going to redistribute it to you. See, socialism is satanic. And when the rapture happens, guess what? The Antichrist is going to be the next Bernie Sanders. And the youngest generation is going to vote for him because they like the sound of free stuff. And God produced in one moment in our new position in Christ, equality. We all have equal privilege and equal opportunity in Christ. Every one of us is a born-again Christian. And you say, I'm not smart. God gave you a spiritual IQ has nothing to do with your human IQ, has everything to do with your volition. Equality in Christ. Now, where there's freedom, there's what? Inequality. So you as a Christian can choose to study your Bible and grow spiritually, and the fellow brethren can reject the Word of God and remain losers. Equal privilege and equal opportunity in Christ. That means some people will be born again. They'll go to heaven forever, but they won't get any of their reward. You see that? While some believers who chose to stick with God's Word advance in the Christian way of life, and they're going to receive the crown of glory, the crown of life, the crown of righteousness. And they're going to be inducted into a new and eternal order of chivalry called the Order of the Morning Star with other things. Equality in Christ. Don't you forget it. He gave us a new identification. We're going to study that in our next verse. We've been delivered from the sovereignty of the sin nature. As an unbeliever, you had to function in the flesh. It was your only choice. Now we can choose to function in the Spirit. We have the guarantee of a resurrection body. Removal of all scar tissue of the soul. And an eternal inheritance stored for you in heaven. We have an entrance into the royal family of God. It means we're liable as children of God to be disciplined when we disobey God. We become a royal ambassador. That means we represent God to our fellow man with the message of reconciliation. We enter a new royal priesthood where Christ is our high priest. We receive the indwelling of God the Father. It's never happened before. We receive the indwelling of Jesus Christ. We gain access to the musterion. 
That means the information pertaining to your unique spiritual life of the church age. Where our polytema privileges are outlined, we're a citizen of heaven, and there are certain privileges associated with that. We have access to spiritual truth and the ten problem-solving devices. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, the Bible says, The natural man receiveth not the things of God, nor can he know them because they are spiritual. So as an unbeliever, you couldn't understand, you couldn't receive spiritual truth, but now as a born-again Christian, you can. We have escrow blessings, some for time and some for eternity. We looked at super grace blessings last week. We receive election, and that is privilege. We share the election of Jesus Christ. We receive predestination, and that is the package to get you to Christ's likeness. Remember, we're glory, we're made into the self same image. That is our predestination. Thirty ninth thing we received as salvation were presented as a gift from God the Father to God the Son. And this right here is the point. Why does the church age exist? Why are we here in the church age? Do you know why? It's, it's, it's funny, it leads all the way into eternity past. Did you know that Jesus Christ, as a member of the Godhead, had a royal family? That is, God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. And He was known as the Son of God. He had divine family. When Jesus Christ was born on earth, He was born in the Davidic line from the tribe of Judah. And uh, as a Jewish man from the tribe of Judah, He is going to fulfill the Davidic dynasty. God promised David your kingdom will endure forever. He's going to do that through Christ. And so Jesus, born as a Jew, has a family. It's Jewish believers. So His first title is the Son of God as a member of the Trinity. His second title is the Son of Man as a member of the Jewish royalty. But his third title is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. You see, when he won the victory of the cross, he received a third royal patent. King of Kings and Lord of Lords. But he had no royal family to complement his third royal patent. He had a family as God. God the Holy Spirit and God the Father. He had a family as the Davidic dynasty. That is Jewish believers. But he had no family as the King of kings and Lord of lords. Therefore, God the Father intercalated the church age to form a new royal family to complement Jesus Christ's strategic victory on the cross. And I've got that memorized for good reason. It's why I'm here. It's why I'm alive. I am a member of the royal family of God. And I exist in the church age because God is forming a new royal family. Yes, He is. And when that family is complete, when it's complete, it's going to be taken off this earth. And the church age will end. God saw fit to put me in human history. Bam, right there. I didn't earn it. I didn't deserve it. Isn't that wonderful? That's grace. 
And then the 40th thing that God gave you at the moment you were born again is the fact that you were born again into a spiritual life, undefiled. It's the only revocable absolute. See, 39 of these things can and never will be taken away from you. They cannot be taken away. 39, but 40th can. It's called fellowship. In John 15, in a prophecy of Christ, He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in Me, minnow, that abides in fellowship, and I in Him, He bears much fruit, that is divine good. For apart from Me, that is carnality, you can do nothing, human good. So at this point, we need to go back to a diagram, and I need to show you. I need to hit escape. Yeah. I don't guess I was. I thought I hit share, but I don't guess I did. The 40th thing that God gave you the moment you were born again is a spiritual life. And we should recognize that 39 of the things that God gave you have to do with a top circle. They cannot be taken away. They cannot change. They're irrevocable. That means once He gives them, He'll never take them back. And they are absolute. This means it's not gradient. All or nothing. 39 of these things are irrevocable absolutes. But there is one revocable absolute. Right down here. It's called fellowship with God. It's the bottom circle. Now when we sin, we lose fellowship with God. And I always, it's known as carnality in the Bible. It's the faraway land of the prodigal child. So when we sin, even as a newly born again Christian, we lose fellowship with God. How do you regain fellowship with God? It's 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. God takes that sin and He marks it away. He erases it. He separates our sin as far away from us as the east is from the west. And we regain fellowship. Now here's the point. It took me years as a believer to ever get in front of this teaching. So the point is this. When we're born again, the first thing we ought to be trying to do is find a pastor who can teach us the Bible. Not out here on the mission field. Not marching for Christ. Not in activities. Not in unions. Not in demonstrations. In Bible class. I wasted a great portion of my Christian life not having ever heard this. But thank God I eventually did. Whew. You see, as a Baptist, this right here was walking the aisle and rededicating my life to Christ. I rededicate my life. You know you've been out being a wild child. So every once in a while, you've got to walk down the aisle in front of the congregation and rededicate yourself. The problem is, it was an emotional deal. And I rededicated, guess what? The flesh. Because the pastor never said when I got down to the end of the aisle, now you need to use 1 John 1, 9 if you really, that's a true rededication. 
He never told me that. All it was was empty repentance. So the revocable absolute is fellowship with God in time. Our spiritual life. Now, <clears throat> what we're going to have to do is develop this because our spiritual life, in fact, is our priesthood. Let's just put a P right there. Might as well put... And if you try to function in your priesthood out here, guess what? The Bible calls it defiled. I want you to remember that word because it has to do with the Old Testament. In the Jewish age, the priest had some duties to do before he functioned in his priesthood every day. And if he didn't do them, he was defiled. And he could become defiled in different ways. The Bible outlined that. We're to operate clean from our priesthood. And we understand that forgiveness and cleansing comes from 1 John 1, nine. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to bring, to bring us forgiveness and cleansing. That's how we operate, clean from the priesthood, undefiled. So if we sin and we know it, we confess it to God the Father in Jesus' name, and we receive forgiveness and cleansing, not only for the sin that we named, but for the ones we can't remember. Okay, that's simple to you. And I'm hammering this into you so hard. Do you know why? This is being fought against right now. I want it so clear in your mind that if all the churches shut down across America because we're in some kind of war, that you can set your children down and teach them this out of the Bible without Pastor Brad. It's that important. See, you need to know this for yourself. And you need to know it so well that you can explain it simply to someone else. You may just deliver someone from religion and having to embarrass themselves by rededicating the flesh twice a year at their local church. You see that? So what we're going to do is take a look at the priesthoods of the Bible. We're going to take a coffee break right here and we'll come back to that. Let's take a, let's take a short break. Studying the Word of Truth. We're in the Word of Truth and we are studying a verse that has contrast in it. Okay, it's black and white. And there are verses in the Bible which are black and white. And our verse teaches us as unbelievers, we were totally separated and depraved and going to hell. But as believers, we've been, we've been moved into a new position in Christ. And in that position, we share all that Christ has and is. It's as black and white as you can get. I mean, this is a great contrasting verse, okay? So even a dummy can learn it. That's what I'm telling you. Now, there are verses in the Bible that are different shades of gray. They're uh, not nearly as stark contrast, and they're um, harder to learn. But this is not one of them. In Adam, we were in spiritual death. And in Christ, we're made alive. See that? Well, we've seen that in Christ, we receive a priesthood. And with that priesthood, we have a spiritual life to maintain. It takes maintenance. And I want to show you some priesthoods through the Bible because it changes in the dispensations. Perhaps I should give you a timeline and we should recognize the very first dispensation is the age of the Gentiles. Now remember that Job and Noah and Abram lived in the age of the Gentiles. Then we had the Jewish age. 
This is the age of Moses and Israel. And eventually Christ will separate Christ and we'll put an H there for hypostatic union. This is when God was on the earth in a human body. The hypostatic union lasted 33 years. Ended with the cross and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then finally, on the day of Pentecost, circa 30 A.D., a new dispensation started. And it was called the church age. Now the church is the body of Christ. When it's completed, the exit resurrection will happen. As people call it the rapture. And God is going to finish out the age of Israel. He owes them seven years in the land. And He's going to give it to them. It's called the tribulation. It's separated in two halves. At the end of the tribulation, the second advent will occur. This is what we're studying in Revelation 19. Jesus is going to institute His kingdom with all-out warfare. The line of the tribe of Judah is going to slay the enemies of Israel with a sword that comes from His mouth. The blood is going to run as deep as a horse's bridle. Complete and total warfare. And then He is going to set up His kingdom for 1K, 1,000 years upon the earth. He is going to reign and rule from Jerusalem. We're going to see in Ezekiel 38, 39, and 40, there will be a temple there. It's called the Millennial Temple. And there will be a specialized priesthood in a, even in the Millennium. This is going to end with a skirmish, which is really not a skirmish. It's called the Gog Magog Revolution. And then finally we have the great white throne and the separation of all humanity into the eternal state. <clears throat> so there are your dispensations. The age of the Gentiles. The Jewish age. The hypostatic union. The church age. The tribulation which is actually an extension of the Jewish age. And the millennium. Now you're over here. I believe you're very close to this arrow going up. So what we want to do is take a look at the different priesthoods of these different eras. And the first thing I want to do is take a look at... Let's put priesthoods up here one Gentiles in the age of the Gentiles it was a paternal priesthood specifically the father of the family we can just put the father um, if you want to in your Bible you can turn to Job chapter 1 verse 5 best verse on the outline of the paternal priesthood or the father as the priest of the family that was the male the elder male of the family was the priest Job 1 5 so it was when the days of feasting had run their course now, you need to understand in the age of the Gentiles, there was an inherent law. An inherent law. It was a spoken law. It was the Word of God spoken where the Father passed down the Word of God by teaching His sons. I, I have to believe it was every night around the dinner table. It's an excellent opportunity to communicate the Word of God to your children. When you're all there together. And he taught his sons daily. 
the inherent law. The trouble is, we don't know what was in it. It was spoken and not recorded. What we do know is there was a priesthood. We're going to see it right here. So Job is functioning under the inherent law. It says, so in the days of feasting, somewhere in the inherent law, they were to take a break from normal life and to celebrate. Obviously, it was not ritual without reality. There was some doctrine to go with these feast days. That Job was sinned and sanctify them. That means set them apart from their sins that they had committed, maybe. And he would rise early in the morning to fulfill his priesthood and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. Now, every sacrificial offering in the Bible points to one thing. It was a shadow what? Christology. And so every animal sacrifice, every grain offering, pointed to the cross where Jesus would die for the sins of the world. So you need to recognize the sacrifices that were made were made on the behalf of His believing children in order to sanctify them for their sins according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be. That's volitional. You see this? Now this is important. Job did not pressure his children under legalism he let them function in their own volition. And he said, because they have their freedom, they may have sinned. That's important. That's love. For Job has said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their right lobes. Thus Job fulfilled his priesthood with regularity. Okay? So in the age of the Gentiles, there was a priesthood. And we recognized that there had to be some form of forgiveness for sins committed. Because we're free, that means we can commit sin but God always gave us a method to rebound, to regain the spiritual life. We're good. I can tell my Bible students, they're on key. I mean, they're zoomed in on this thing. The rest of you are thinking about what you're going to eat for uh, lunch. So here's what I want to tell you. I want, I want you to think about something for a moment. Every priesthood is to operate undefiled clean and God gave us the means to operate undefiled in every dispensation in the age of the Gentiles it's different Job had to make animal sacrifices for his children thank God we're done with that okay Noah lived in the same dispensation and guess what on the ark he even carried special animals to do this with. Remember that? Abram started out life as a Gentile. And really his child was the first Jew. So we see that he was in a transitional period. So the next dispensation is in fact the Jewish age. And it was a specialized priesthood, the sons of Aaron. Now I'm going to turn over to <clears throat> Exodus. You go back in your Bible, but you go forward in history. It's important that we look at Exodus 28 because I'm going to bring it back up. 
And, and those of you who are keen Bible students are fishing to have a big exclamation point go off in your head. But the rest of you are going to have to hang around for the culmination of this thing where I bring it all together. I want you to look at Exodus 28. And God is commanding. He has given the commands to produce the uniform for the priest. And part of this was the breastplate that he was to wear every day. Now watch, in, in Exodus 28, 17, God's given the law to Bezalel and Oholiab and all the other skilled artisans and craftsmen. And he says, you shall put settings of stones in it. The breastplate. Four rows of stones. One, two, three, four. The first row shall be Sardis, Topaz, and an emerald. I want you to remember that. This shall be the first row. The second row shall be turquoise, sapphire, and diamond. The third row, jacinth, agat, and amasit. And the fourth row, beryl, onyx, and jasper. Beryl, onyx, and jasper. I want you to think about those three words in your brain. And kind of leave them there in order. Burl, onyx, and jasper. Okay, so this is the breastplate that the specialized priesthood is to wear when they function as a priest. Now I want you to go over to, to Exodus 29. And this is what you shall do to hallow them. That means to initiate them into the priesthood for ministering to me as priest. Now these are Aaron and his sons. Take one young bull and two rams without blemish. Now this is Jesus Christ in His impeccability. The animals had to be flawless, see? And unleavened bread. That means no yeast. Yeast in the Bible represents sin. Here, this is Jesus in hypostatic union and unleavened cakes mixed with oil. The oil always represents the Holy Spirit. And unleavened wafers anointed with oil. You shall make them of wheat flour. The flour represents the body of our Lord. You shall put them in one basket and bring them in the basket with the bull and the two rams. And Aaron and his son shall bring you to the door of the tabernacle meeting, and you shall what? Wash. Clean them up with water. This is the initiation into the priesthood. They had to be washed. Now there is an identical in the church age. The initiation into your priesthood was God taking you out of Adam and making you to drink into Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. That was your initiation. <coughs> the first washing. It was, a, it was a washing all over. I want you to remember. A washing all over. Now later you're going to need a foot washing. Hold on. I saw some light bulbs come on. Because you know John 13. This is the first cleansing. It was the initiation into the priesthood. It represents salvation in the church age. Where God took you out of Adam and dumped you into Christ and you received forgiveness and cleansing for all the sins you'd ever produced as an unbeliever. Washed. In Titus 3.5 it says we receive the washing of regeneration. Now for those of you who have really been Bible students for a while, you're going to recognize a phrase. 
continuity and change. That probably rang some bells. Continuity and change. The continuity is this, that every dispensation has a priesthood. The change is this, it develops as we go in human history. See, we started out in the age of the Gentiles where the old man was the priest for the whole family. We headed right into the Jewish age where it was a specialized priesthood in the Aaronic line, the sons of Aaron. We're going to head into the church and we're going to see a universal priesthood where every believer is a priest unto God. We're going to go into the tribulation and it's going to be a revised Jewish age priesthood where they have a temple functioning. And then we're going into the millennium and guess what? We're going to have a millennial priesthood. Even with Jesus on the earth. Now, we saw the first washing. And we've seen that when Aaron and his sons were initiated into the priesthood, they were washed at the gate. Now, We've got to see the next washing, and I'm going to bring you to the passage. We're going to see it in Exodus 30, verses 17 to 21. Now Aaron and his sons have been inducted into the priesthood of Israel. And now they're going to be told how to function daily in the priesthood. Exodus 30, 17, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, You shall also make a, lot, a labor of bronze. This is a big bowl. It's base also of bronze for washing. You shall put it between the tabernacle of meeting and the altar. And you shall put water in it. Now this was a it this was a miracle, okay, of the desert. Have you ever tried casting anything? Bronze is a mix of copper and brass. And <clears throat> these Jews were out in the desert. And not only were they going to build this huge bronze laver, and you know what God said? Use all of the copper and the brass you have left to make it. I don't want any left over. Make it as big as humanly possible. And not only that, He said, I want you to make 12 bronze bulls and you're going to stand this bronze laver on the top of these bulls' backs. These guys didn't have a shop. They didn't have a welder. They didn't have a cutting torch. What they had was sand. Perfect for casting. And so they took every bit of bronze that was left over and they built a huge bronze laver. Now the vastness of the bronze laver represented the extent of the forgiveness of God. You can't find the end of it. That's why he said use all of it. The bulls holding the laver represented God's omnipotent power to forgive. I want to stop and tell you it's so much fun teaching the Bible because God is awesome. And He's got these Jews out in the desert. It just so happens that these artisans these skilled craftsmen, these laborers, the metallurgists, all of these Jews came into the desert having been trained in Egypt 
of how to produce these things. And do you know what they were doing with these skills in Egypt? Everything they built was used to worship demons. And now they're free and they're out in the desert and they're free to worship the one true God. Freedom is required for worship. You can't go to North Korea and do this on Sunday morning, friend. You can't go to any Muslim country and do this. It takes freedom. So the Jews were freed from Egypt. And they were freed and they were able to use their skills as artisans, as craftsmen, as metallurgists to worship the one true God. And there they built the giant bowl, the laver, and those brass bulls to stand it upon. In verse 19, For Aaron and his son shall wash their hands and their feet with water from it. When they go to the tabernacle of meeting, when they come near to the altar to minister, to burn an offering made by fire to the Lord, they shall wash with water, guess what? Lest they die. So, guess what? The command to was to operate clean from the priesthood, undefiled. And when they went in the morning and they washed their hands and they washed their feet, it was the first John one nine of the Jewish age. They wrecked. They knew the teachings of the bronze labor. They knew what the bulls were there and why the labor was so huge. And they recognized if they did not follow the command to operate clean from the priesthood, they would die. And did you know in, Jewish, in, in Jesus' age, it got to be such a problem that when the priest went in to offer sacrifices or burn incense in the temple, they tied a rope around his waist. Do you know why? So many of them were struck dead. Because they were into ritual without reality. They didn't know the doctrine behind anything they were doing. Lest they die. So we ought to understand God emphasizes the principle in every generation to operate clean from the priesthood undefiled. So they shall wash their hands and feet lest they die, and it shall be a statute forever to them, to him and his descendants throughout their generations. That means if you're in the Jewish age, this is a command. Now Jesus teaches His disciples in John chapter 13. This is the age of the hypostatic union. You have to turn all the way over to the Gospel of John. It's the last Passover and the first Lord's table. In John chapter 13, the, the shallow people believe that this teaches humility when in fact the spiritual principle behind it is functioning clean from the priesthood. Okay? So in John 13, 5, after he had the first Lord's table, he poured water into a basin. Hello. Have you ever heard of that? The labor. And began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with he, which with he was girded. And he came to Simon Peter and, said to him, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? And Jesus answered to him, 
What I am doing, you do not understand now because you're a hammerhead. You're dull. And you're not relating this to your priesthood. But you will know after this. And it took the Holy Spirit coming down to indwell Peter to knock the crust out of his head for him to understand this. Peter said to him, You'll never wash my feet. And Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you will have no part with me. There is no fellowship without cleansing. There is no operation of the priesthood in defilement. If you want fellowship with God, you must operate clean from the priesthood. Peter still didn't get it. In verse 9, Peter says to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. He's saying, dunk me. I don't want you to just clean my feet then. Just wash my whole body. Jesus says to him, boy, he's patient. He who is bathed needs only to wash his feet. Now, when did the bathing happen? At the initiation. What happens when you walk on this earth and you stumble? You sin. You step in a mud hole. You need to wash your feet periodically. So what Jesus is telling him, when he believed, he was bathed all over. That's the initiation. But he eventually sinned, and now he really needs to regain fellowship through 1 John 1, nine. He who is bathed needs only wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. Now, the one that wasn't clean was Judas. You see that? He was an unbeliever. For he who knew who would betray him, and therefore he said, you're not all clean. So when he had washed their feet and taken his garments, he sat down again and he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? And the question is, do you know the two washings of the Bible? I hope that you've written it down in your notes because you've just seen them. In Exodus 29.4, you saw the initiation into the priesthood and Aaron and his sons washed from head to toe. And now you've seen the second washing which is required daily for fellowship. It's 1 John 1, 9. We saw it in Exodus 30, 17 through 20. And now we're seeing in John chapter 13. I want you to turn over quickly now to John chapter 15. And I want you to see something. In John 15, 3, Jesus says, He's, he's continuing to teach him, You are already clean. Because of the word which I have spoken to you in John chapter 13. And the word that he spoke was in fact forgiveness and cleansing is required to operate in the priesthood. You are clean. Now, <clears throat> I haven't got to fully develop what I was going to teach you because we're going to see what happens in the church age under our universal priesthood. And then I'm going to bring you around to the tribulation and the millennium. We're going to see priesthoods there. Are you all okay? This is shell shock, I know. But believe it or not, I was able to teach this to my youth group to the effect that they actually remembered it. I hammered it into them so hard, I probably got about six guys. And I want to tell you, one of those six guys that are, has, has now entered the ministry as a young man. And he was a heathen child. I'll tell you. It took somebody to teach him discipline first, and then the Word of God. 
And so <clears throat> I thank you for your attention and attendance this morning.